bat down, but anyway, nice to be here. Um, and my apologies for the, you know, mistakes of graduate school at BYU and, and the University of Utah, but when my uh, daughters came up here, we sort of got, I attended here, but didn't graduate from here. But when my daughters came back up, got reintroduced to Utah State, and we love Utah State, and we're true blue Aggies, so, in every sense of the word. <laughs> Not ultimate Aggie, though. Um, <laughs> My daughter is, but I'm not. Uh, okay. Appreciate the opportunity to be with you. They asked me to, I, I don't know, it looks to me like maybe this is one of those classes where you come and hear guest speakers and kind of sit in the back row and catch a nap. So I'll hope to give you something that's interesting and maybe something worthwhile to you, especially if you are... Uh, interested in getting into business for yourself. Um, uh, as Spencer said, Mountain West Small Business Finance is a um, private nonprofit corporation. Now, the minute you hear nonprofit, if you're a good business student, you kind of go, wait a minute, you know, I thought you were supposed to make a profit in business. But, um, this is a little bit of a unique situation. I'll tell you a little bit about how we got started and what we do, but I think uh, also what might be of greater interest to you will be for me to share with you some of my experiences as I have observed uh, small businesses at every stage of their development and how particularly they interact with the finance world. Um, and finance for small business means uh, Main Street finance, not Wall Street finance. Um, I know just enough about Wall Street finance to be dangerous. We do uh, through this SBA program have some interaction with Wall Street, but when you're talking about small business, um, you're usually talking about banks, savings and loans, credit unions, kind of what I call Main Street finance. So let me start, just tell you a little bit about Mountain West. Um, we started back in 1980, and um, if, that's probably were before all you were born, but if you know anything about kind of what was going on at that time, uh, Jimmy Carter was the president, um, and our economy was going through some pretty severe inflation. Um, something that since then, the Federal Reserve has really clamped down on and, and watched, but prior to that time they sort of, I guess, let it get away and so um, we were dealing in those days with prime interest rates somewhere around 14 percent and by 1981-82 we were dealing with 20 percent prime interest rate so that you can see the difference uh, between that and, and today when prime is probably now around six and a half and the Fed lowered 50 basis points today so it could probably be now somewhere around seven, I guess, six and a half, seven, somewhere in that range. I'm not sure where it is. I, I don't deal with prime much. but um, So uh, here I am with two other buddies and this will kind of tell you my business background. I have a degree in political science and education, and so do my two buddies. And we get involved in a political campaign back in 1978 for a guy running for Congress, and, and he doesn't win, but he does good enough that he catches the eye of Scott Matheson, who was the uh, then 
uh, governor of the state, Democrat. I know that's hard to believe, but we actually really did have a Democrat governor one day in the past. Um, so he catches the eye of, of Matheson, and Matheson says, I think you ran a good campaign. You appear to be a pretty sharp guy. I'm going to make you the director of economic development for the state of Utah. And so this guy, a Utah State graduate, by the way, takes over. And, uh, and he comes to the three of us and says, hey, I heard about this program. Small Business Administration, and uh, it's a way to get financing to small businesses at six or seven percent compared to what they could borrow, you know, from a bank at at fourteen, fifteen in the in that day. So this is something that's really potentially very beneficial. Uh, the State Office of Economic Development, if you're not familiar with it, focuses a lot of activity on recruiting businesses from outside of the state to come and locate here in the state. And the big deal in those days was we're going to attract uh, American Express Travelers Check Division to locate here. And if any of you are familiar with the uh, best part of Salt Lake Valley and down by the Valley Fair Mall, they actually came. And there's a Traveler's Check Processing Division there that, that actually was the first expansion that American Express did out of the New York City area. So that gets a lot of attention, but it you know, brings some jobs in from outside, creates some jobs for Utahns. But the real heart and meat of job creation in, in Utah and most uh, everywhere else is small business. And so he says, let's see if we can get this program to get 6% loans in the state of Utah. So this is the type of guy that's a big picture, strate big picture guy, you know, strategic thinker. And the three of us political science and former high school teachers are are uh, sort of detail people. One of them isn't, but the other two are. So, so we, we, he says, Look, let's do this. So we, we do it. You know, we start, we form a, an entity uh, that's a nonprofit corporation. And what does that mean? It really just means that there's no stockholders. Nobody owns it. It's sort of exists in and of itself. Um, it has a board of directors um, that uh, sort of watches over, kind of directs things, and it has members who really don't do anything other than say, yeah, we think it's a nice thing, and they meet once a year and elect a board of directors. And then they have staff, uh, employees. So we start this um, question. Are you referring to a corporation or a nonprofit corporation? It is a corporation. It is a nonprofit corporation. Okay, yeah. Nonprofit, you don't have to have a board, board members to have a nonprofit company, do you? I don't, I don't know what the Utah statutes say for sure. Um, I, actually, I don't think you do. Some of this was put in place because of the requirement of the SBA. That's referring to corporation now, right? Okay. Yeah. I think most nonprofits, if they don't have a board of directors, would have a board of trustees, which would function in a similar manner. But I guess, I guess the point to make here, a couple of points, is we create this entity, we seek licensure or certification from the Small Business Administration. And then we got three guys with political science majors and former teachers that are going to go out now and start making loans. And to be real honest with you, I mean, we don't know an asset from the hole in the ground. Um, you know, we get a balance sheet put in front of us and we go, well, this looks interesting, wonder what it says. 
Um, so I guess in that respect, we were the ultimate entrepreneurs. <laughs> um, we had $30,000 that was uh, given to us by the city of Salt Lake and by the city of Bountiful. Um, they had some grant money that they'd been given that they weren't going to use, so this guy at the state convinced them to, to give us that money, and away we went. Now, our experience from this point forward is going to be very similar to what most entrepreneurs will experience, except for the fact that we didn't really know what we were doing. But if you're in political science and teaching, you learn to fake it really well. And that's basically what we had to do for a while until we could learn it on our own, figure it out on our own. Um, the experience that we had was that by the time we got this up and organized and licensed by the SBA, the $30,000 had run out. And so we basically had to go back to work and this became uh, after hours and weekends activity. And, um, you know, we've made our first loan in uh, about 1982, um, and, you know, it took off from there. Um, and fortunately, we were able to get uh, some pretty valuable training in. Uh, finance and reading a balance sheet and profit and loss and understanding banking and understanding what banks look for and uh, you know we took we took it from there uh, but we probably ran it out of our basement so to speak uh, working full-time jobs and then doing this on the side and fortunately we had employers that we either fooled or they didn't care, you know, if we were taking calls for this business in the middle of the day or, or something like that. But we actually were, were finally able to, to make this work. And we actually set up a structure where we, we set up a separate for-profit uh, corporation and we set up a contractual arrangement so that we could handle the finances and, uh, and essentially we loaned um, the nonprofit our money and our resources until it got up and, and operating. Um, and then finally when we reached a critical mass of making enough loans and having enough what they refer to as servicing income coming in, then we were able to uh, eventually, one at a time, sort of peel away from the full-time job and become employees of the nonprofit corporation. That's uh, not at all unlike what I see hundreds of small businesses doing all the time. And, uh, and that's kind of the other part of what I wanted to visit with you about today is just sort of talking about my observations of how small businesses get started and, and how they eventually are able to make a go of it. Um, before I go to that, does anybody have any question about Mountain West, what we do I mean I wasn't sure you'd be all that interested in that part of it, but I'd be happy to to tell you more about what it does or how it works. What happens with like retained earnings in a nonprofit? Because it's nonprofit, so are those just retained earnings? Or yes, yes, they are retained, and, and uh, there's we are a um, 501c4 organization which means that uh, that's a, a reference to the IRS code 
and it basically says this is the type of organization that's involved in community development such as a chamber of commerce or something like that. We, we are exempt from paying uh, federal income tax or federal corporate tax and state corporate tax. Now, we're not a 501c3, which you might be familiar with. That would be like the United Way, which would be a charitable organization. Um, so we have different restrictions, but most nonprofits, the main restriction is the distribution of assets. And so the, the earnings stay retained within the corporation. If we dispose of any assets, we have to either sell them on the open market or we have to donate them to a different nonprofit. Um, there are no owners, so there are no dividends paid to the owners. Uh, but that doesn't uh, preclude us from paying good salaries and good benefits. And that's um, one of the things that, uh, that we've been able to do uh, to keep good employees. Uh, we pay an extremely generous uh, benefit package and we pay um, probably at the upper end of the of the range for uh, a comparable job. So a loan officer in my organization would probably make a little more money than a bank loan officer at most conservative Utah banks uh, would make and I do that intentionally because what else am I going to do with the money? You know, it either just sits there or I pay it out and keep my employees happy. So, so then who determines salaries? Is it the board of directors or is it? Yeah, we're, we're uh, careful. The IRS does keep an eye on that, and so we have a, a compensation committee made up of a subset of the board of directors. Um, we follow pretty carefully, um, you know, the kind of the general guidelines. We, we uh, participate and are recipients of survey information about comparable salaries for comparable positions in the so-called private sector. And then we, we stay, you know, comfortably within the range, but try to stay at the upper end of that range. Um, when you get way out of whack, then you have, you know, the front page of the Wall Street Journal moments and, and you don't want that. Uh, you know, you don't want the CEO making $600,000 and people scratching their head going, wait, I thought this was a nonprofit community service organization, so. But the, the range is wide enough that we can be comfortable and, and be happy and do well. And, and uh, you know, I can donate money to Utah State every year, which I like to do. And which I probably wouldn't be able to do as much, uh, you know, if I was just getting paid something a little less. So, any other questions about that? Mm -hmm. Um, in fact, you're a nonprofit organization because I don't understand completely, but credit unions are nonprofit, right? They are. And banks are not. Banks are for profit. Correct. So right. Can they compete at a different level to pay more business? Can credit unions do that? Well, if you asked a banker, you'd, you know, their face would turn red and they would say, absolutely, yeah, that's, that's not fair. That, that's the, the, uh, long-standing debate and argument and, and disagreement between the banks and the credit unions is that credit unions are nonprofit and they don't pay taxes. And so they're able to offer their services to their members at a, at a uh, cost that's, that's perceived by the banks to be, you know, disadvantageous to the banks because the banks say, we can't provide that same service because we have to pay taxes. 
Um, so uh, my experience is, yeah, you'll really get a banker riled up if you get him into that discussion. Um, I think most bankers are supportive of the, you know, small, truly organizational or community-based credit union. There's a place for them, but wh where they get their hackles up is, you know, Mountain America or, or America, what's the other one? America First, that are mega credit unions that really, in, in every respect, act like banks. I mean, I was at a credit union um, um, meeting uh, this summer, and I mean, they have the whole gamut. They have the insurance services, they have the brokerage services, they have all of the same products that the banks have, and so the banks look at that and really get get riled up about it. Well, uh, the, that's sort of the nice thing about our entity is that it is, it is sort of one of a kind, if you will. I mean, there are two here in the state of Utah. It's a very specialized, very limited market. Um, it, it, we basically administer a program of a federal agency uh, through a license with that agency, and we pretty much provide one type of loan. We provide real estate financing uh, at a below market rate to small businesses. But the way our program is structured, um, we can't make a loan without the participation of a bank or a credit union. So they don't perceive us so much as competitors, as more as partners that come in and help to enhance the credit worthiness of the of the borrower, so it, the banks view it as a win-win kind of for them and for their borrower. So we we're fortunate we we compete with each other within our own little world, but we don't so much compete with the banks, and so that's we don't they don't view us as a threat. Um, one thing that I, I wanted to share with you is uh, kind of what I've observed in the entrepreneurial development world that's kind of going on in our state right now. There's a really a lot of activity and a lot of interest in programs that can help develop entrepreneurs and give entrepreneurs the tools that they need to go out and, and start businesses and take their great ideas and sort of commercialize them. But there's a lot of misconceptions too when you start talking to small business people or people that are thinking about starting a business. Um, and so I wasn't sure if, if you'd seen this characterization before if you have, I apologize, but but they, you know, what we're seeing in the entrepreneurial world, at least in Utah and Utah government right now, is we, they kind of identify um, four types of businesses. Um, the first one is this kind of self-employed or micro business. Um, the next one is what they call lifestyle type business. The third one is um, growth. And the fourth one is high growth. Um, Self-employed micro would be, example of that would be just independent uh, sole practitioner, one person uh, operation. Um, perhaps somebody involved in crafts or the arts or artisans and um, in some areas professionals could be classified in that category. Like uh, mostly though 
in the professional ranks, again, sole practitioners. So I just looked at a loan today for a dentist that came out of the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, dental school, came here, practiced uh, as an employee at a dental clinic for a year or so. Now he's ready to go out on his own. And he's buying a, an office condo and financing uh, some equipment. And he's going to hang out his shingle and be a dentist. Um, so that would be kind of in that self-employed micro category. Lifestyle, here we're talking about maybe local or regional small businesses, uh, restaurants, retail, retail uh, service businesses, gasoline, convenience stores, that kind of stuff. Um, growth, here we'd be talking about a business that's regional or even national in its outreach, in its scope. Um, probably a more targeted market or a niche market or a manufacturer, let's say. Um, and, uh, you know, maybe a manufacturer or a fabricator or a printer or something like that. And then the high growth would be, you know, something that could potentially have a national or global market. Usually something that's technology based. Um, something, uh, many of these are businesses that deal with um, business process. You know, something to improve the, the business process or not just business process, but just process and paper flow or people flow in general. And they, they oftentimes are businesses that deal with intellectual property, uh, patents and copyrights and things like that. So the, one of the things that budding entrepreneurs uh, talk about, particularly when they come looking for money, uh, is, you know, they say, well, you know, why isn't there more venture capital available for me to start my business? And you kind of have to go through this explanation and show them that, you know, venture capital is really only interested in the businesses in that category. Um, maybe you know, maybe some businesses in, in the growth category, but what, what's, the, what's the purpose of venture capital? Who gets involved in venture capital and what are they trying to accomplish with venture capital? Return. Yeah, I got a lot of money and they want a big return on it. Yeah, and when do they want it? Soon. Soon, yeah. Uh, four to seven year time frame. We're talking about somebody that's got some money, they want to be able to put it in to a business at some stage of the development of that business, usually not in the early stage. Uh, there's a few that will come in at early stage, but usually they want to come in after you kind of have a proven track record, a, tr a proven uh, product and proven management, they will come in and perhaps look for ways to enhance and improve on management and improve the business process in internally, but they want to be able to put their money in and then in three to five to seven years be able to sell what they bought at, you know, a dollar a share to somebody else that's willing to pay fifty dollars a share for and you know if you want to start a restaurant that's probably not going to happen uh, maybe if you're Cafe Rio 
Um, but, you know, the, the majority of restaurants, for example, fall into this category. They're lifestyle businesses. What are some other characteristics of, of these businesses? They're, um, is that how you spell closely? They're closely held. What do I mean by closely held? Right. Yeah, they're typically, um, the, especially the businesses in these two categories, they're typically sole proprietorships, meaning one owner, or maybe um, a husband, wife, or sometimes as you start to move out, you know, away from this to this and this, you know, here's where you'll start to see corporations, LLCs, and partners, you know, the same over here. But there's a, there's a close group, you know, I rarely see small businesses where I have more than five owners. You know, I may have five owners that own 20% each, but most of the time the people that we deal with sort of on the main street finance level is, you know, either sole proprietor or um, a corporation with one stockholder owning 100% or maybe a partnership, 50-50 partnership. That's characteristic of businesses in these three categories. And their, their sort of, the, their attitude is very much, I started this business, this is my baby, like you said, and I'm not gonna let somebody from the outside, you know, come, come and tell me what to do. Um, and I, I see a lot of times, uh, businesses with good ideas that their growth and their development is constricted because they have that attitude that I just can't take on a partner. I tried that once. I couldn't get along with a partner. You know, we had different ideas and we wanted to take the business, you know, in opposite directions. And so these types of businesses, you know, stay that way and so they're not um, compatible with the idea of venture capital. Somebody in this type of business sort of gets the big picture where they say, okay, I think I've got something here that's really going to be big and so I'm willing to have 30 or 40 percent of something that's really big uh, and let somebody else have 60 or 70 percent of it with me uh, and you know have something really big and have a nice piece of that big pie then try to have it all for myself. Um, and so then if you look at those four types of businesses then where would you think the money would come from to start those kinds of businesses? Where would the money come from to start those types of businesses? You've got a great idea or you're a great cook or you've got, you just inherited a corner on 14th North and Main Street in Logan. Where are you going to get the money to put your convenience store there? Isn't that like where you're talking about Main Street financing or even like personal savings? Or? Yeah, yeah. And, and to start with, it really is going to not be Main Street. It's, where's it going to be? It's going to be very much personal. And that would include your own personal savings. 
you know what that is? Home equity line of credit. Yeah. If you have a home and you have equity, <laughs> you know. Um, where else? Family. Mm hmm. Friends. There's one more, I'll show you something. I meant to get this out. I heard an interesting small business success story. You ever seen these? <laughs> I mean, these are just nail clippers, but kind of nice, fancy looking. This was made by a small business in Long Island called Tweezer Man. That guy started his business with credit cards. He basically, now I don't know, you guys probably get some of these, but I probably get 10 to 12 credit card solicitations a week. And so this guy had a great idea, wanted to get into business. So basically, when those 15 or 20 credit card solicitations came in over a three or four week period, he signed up for all of them. And he, and he drew his credit limit on all of them, basically all at the same time. Back in those days, I and mean, we were talking about a $5,000 credit limit on a credit card was a big limit. Um, and, and he's paying 18% on that money. And that's how he started his business. Um, now, I would not recommend to any of you that you start your business by maxing out your, your credit cards. Um, but I've seen more than one um, business started that way. Uh, it, it's sort of, it, it's, the, it's the drive of the entrepreneur, it's the, it's the, the you know, thought process that I can't fail, I know I've got a good idea, I know it'll be successful. Um, you know, I'll work as, as many hours as I need to to make it successful. I mean, I hear that day in and day out and I admire it and it's what makes small business go. But it also, you know, uh, it, it also is what drives people to, you know, borrow money at 18% on their credit card. Um, you know, I've seen a lot of heartache and a lot of friendships busted up over, you know, businesses that were started with loans or, or so-called investments by friends and family. So, uh, but this is really to start any of the businesses there, this is really where you kind of have to start. Um, and you don't get to Main Street, uh, meaning a bank or a credit union, until you have a little bit of a track record, until you're, you know, actually making widgets or actually, uh, you know, flipping hamburgers or tortillas or whatever it is. Um, you really... Uh, you know, you don't get there until you've kind of done this and you've been creative and you've uh, worked, a, worked a, a full time job and started your business on the side. I mean, occasionally I'll have somebody that will say, I want to come in, I want the bank to loan me $200,000 to start my business. And 90, 80, 90,000 of that is to pay my salary, you know, on borrowed money while I start my business. And you can imagine that most bankers uh, will say, no, that's, you know, bank's not in business to be your partner and to pay your salary while you try to, you know, make a go of this. And so, 
um, personal then goes to Main Street, which would be banks, uh, maybe SNLs, credit unions, and uh, the SBA is really their federal government agency to sort of make that leap from your personal investment to institutional uh, debt uh, a little easier. You know, uh, take some of the risk away for the bank so that they'll make that loan. So, and then venture capital ends up being something totally different that comes into play really only in those high growth businesses. So, um, so that's, let's see, I was supposed to go what, how long? Oh, okay, but I'm supposed to leave time for questions, so I'm sorry I've ra rambled on too long, but I don't know if that was any, of any help to you. I hope, it, hope something there was helpful, but do you have questions about this or anything that I might help you with? What's the best and worst loan in the last 20 years or whatever? Oh, God, I've made a lot of good ones. I mean, you know, businesses that really have done well. Um, we've made a loan to, we've, we've made a couple loans to gastronomy restaurants, the Market Street folks. Um, we made a loan to the guy that developed Sport Court. Um, that, you know, that started out just a locally owned Utah business. Of course, now it's, it's been bought out by a, a large national firm, made that guy a whole lot of money. That was, that was one. Uh, you know, I've also made a lot of bad ones, and not as many bad ones as good ones, but, um, I think the thing that I've learned um, from the bad loans that, that we've made is that more often than not, the, the loans go bad. You always hear that loans go bad for lack of capital, but lack of capital goes hand in hand with lack of, of management experience and expertise. And we've made a fair number of loans to people that say, I've worked in this industry all my life, now I want to go out and start my own business in, in the same industry. And you would typically think that somebody that's, that's worked in a particular line of business all their life and worked at various levels would have the expertise, but sometimes um, the, there's a big difference between the employee and, you know, the person where the buck stops, the owner of the business, and and that's one thing that that we've learned is management is really important to Main Street lending. Mm -hmm. What's the largest loan that Les has done? Uh, we can do loans up to four million dollars, and when we add the participation that comes from the bank. Um, we've done up to about a, um, well, I think it was about seven and a half, eight million dollar project. What percentage do you guys use? Or how, can you explain how your percentage is? Like? Yeah, typically, um, uh, the typical, it's called a 504 loan. That just refers to the, to the uh, statute again. And basically, it's, 50% from the bank, 40, whoops, I did that in the wrong place, 40% from what we're, we're, the generic term for what we are is a certified development company, and then we expect at least 10% contribution from the business owners. Um, so on a million dollar project, we'd expect a business to put 100,000 down and then we would finance the other 90%. Compare that to what a bank would do without us and that would be usually 20, well, I, 
banks get a little more aggressive, 20 to 30 percent down from the business and the rest from the bank. So the benefit that we offer is, you know, if you, you understand the operating cycle of money in, in a business, if you take that much cash out of a business to put it into a building or to buy equipment, it severely hampers the working capital for a business. And so what we do is offer them a way to take less of their valuable working capital out and invest in fixed assets. And the banks like it because our portion of this comes to the borrower at a, a subsidized rate. Basically, today's market, 6% fixed for 20 years. And the banks are at the same time offering their loan probably at around seven and a half to eight, maybe closer to seven and a half now with these declines in the rates. But they won't fix the rate for more than five years. So combination of the two is able to really give a favorable deal to the business and helps the bank out too, because the bank's only in half the deal. It reduces their risk. Mm -hmm. You refinance a lot of those loans that the bank has previously done? Uh, actually, the, uh, I was supposed to repeat these questions, sorry. <laughs> uh, actually, we can't refinance uh, per the rules of our program. So we're just financing new investment, um, it's kind of the economic development, job growth, community development component. If you're just refinancing debt that's already there, then those good public benefits don't result. So we're, we don't do refinance. You said earlier that you, uh, the government gave you guys $30,000, you know, the local government there, <coughs> and that was spent, where did you... Mostly to, to pay my salary for six months. So and to pay the rent, we had to have a little office and, you know, stuff like that. So the money that you extended after that $30,000 was up, did that come out of, like, you guys working or did that come from like the government or? No, it, it basically was money that we contributed to keep the thing going and then eventually once it got to a point where it could pay us back, then it, then it paid us back and, and kept going from there. So in essence, we went to work in our full-time jobs and loaned our own company the money to keep going until it got to a point where it could sustain itself and pay us back. And we, we loaned it at zero interest. We didn't, we didn't charge ourselves interest on it. So, we were dumb. We probably should have. <laughs> any other questions? If any of you have business ideas, I think we have a reception upstairs. And I'll stick around and I'd be happy to, you know, have you bounce ideas off me and thanks.